sheep. So if you got any burdens, you guys can go to him, and you know he's gonna he's gonna help you out with that. So go into number four seven seven. Four seven seven, and we're gonna go for time's sake, verses uh one, three, and four. Four seventy seven. Verses 1, 3, and 4. Precious blood atoning. 
streets of gold, beyond the crystal sea. over here for those of you that do uh, yeah. I've been paying rent for how many yeah one bedroom yeah but this is that mansion we're going to be singing about all right come on church amen I'm satisfied with just the cottage below Right land where 
And then Brother Jack or Brother Max if, or Brother Tom, if one of y'all can just make sure that sound's coming in on the camera, just to be sure, that'd be wonderful. Praise God, that's good singing. Yeah, that's good. I, I think, Brother Jack, I don't know if he, does, if he sings my favorite songs on purpose as the last one to get me pumped up or not, but man, that's good. And by the way, my mansion, it's not gonna, it's not gonna cost 2,600 a month, like my one bedroom apartment. <laughs> and by the way, it's not a room, amen? Your King James Bible says it's a mansion. The modern versions say it's a room. Bless God, I got a mansion God. I don't got a studio apartment God, amen? All right, well, welcome everybody to San Jose Bible Baptist Church. Um, any newcomers, welcome. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here. Hopefully you feel uh, welcome, like you're part of the family. Um, if you have any questions or anything like that after the service, uh, I like to think we, we, we try to be approachable and y chances are you'll have someone approach you before you approach them. But uh, yeah, I just want, want you to know that you're very welcome here. Um, we had street preaching today. Brother Jack was able to lead a boy named Daniel uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. So praise God for that. Um, since we got back from camp, seems like church has really been on fire as it pertains to soul winning. Just keep praying that the Lord will keep that fire going. Amen. Uh, my volunteer sheet guy uh, should be having the volunteer sheets coming around here shortly. Go for it, Brent. So as the Lord would lead it, uh, lead you and put it on your heart to help out in any of the ways that we need, like uh, preparing lunch, bringing lunch, helping out with the nursery or any of those things, uh, please volunteer how the Lord would lead you. Um, Brother Brent's also going to be having some newcomer cards that he's going to pass out as he goes around. If for whatever reason he misses you, um, you know, feel free to just raise your hand or something, but we'd love to pray for you. We'd love to get to, get to know you. Uh, and if he gives you a card and you're not new or it's not your first time, don't take any offense. <laughs> Sometimes he looks at me like he doesn't know who I am. So, it's <laughs> so yeah, pray for him, pray for him. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then also um, going around now for newcomers, uh, this is not for you. So don't don't worry about any of this. But um, as our church members know, we have the Bible uh, Baptist blowout coming out in December. And so with that, we're trying our best to take care of our speakers, take care of their whole trip. Um, you know, it'd be a shame if they had to pay their own way to come and give us something spiritual. Amen. So um, I'm going to try to better explain how the chart is breaking down. So um, a, a few things. One, by you putting your name in one of those boxes underneath a speaker, you're not committing to giving the, I think it says like if 10 members gave $35 a week, that would hit the goal. Um, you're not saying I'm gonna give this much every week by putting your name in a box. That was just to kind of show and encourage, hey, if we all just pitch in a little bit, we can uh, support our speakers. So what you're gonna do is, I, every week I'm gonna update the chart and all you're going to do is for that specific week, if you're giving anything to a speaker, you're just going to write your name in the box that's under that row for that week, under the speaker that you're giving to, and then you'll just write the amount in that box that you're planning to give to the speaker. That way we can keep track of how we're giving, how, the speak, how we're doing on uh, you know, supporting the speakers. And then on the very back page of that uh, packet, it will show our totals so far. So it'll show who's given what and where it's going. That way you can keep 100% you know, track of where everything's going for the speakers. And it also allows you to see maybe, you know, maybe one speaker hasn't been given so much. So for you folks that have written, written in before, like um, as needed, please, uh, God bless you. We appreciate your heart. Don't do that. Um, and I, I think I might have started that trend way back in the day. I just put like, rather than filling in every box, I just put just whatever, just tell me. I thought I was being helpful. But when it comes to logistics and actually divvying up, you know, where the money goes, it would be better if just pick someone. Even if you got to pick names out of a hat, um, just pick, or if you see someone hasn't been given so much as other speakers for whatever reason, uh, just feel free to put your name and the amount for that week in that box, okay? If you have any other questions, if that wasn't as confusing enough, uh, you can come ask me or talk to me about it. Um, after church, I'd be happy to walk you through it, okay? Okay. All right. And then, uh, yeah, to you onliners as well, um, we want to make 
you fo- a lot of you folks that don't have a church near you, we want you to feel welcome, like you're part of our church as well. And so, um, as many of you know, we don't we don't like putting it out there, like you know, donate here, give here. But we've had so many folks that have asked and requested that, that we do on our resources page, we do have a link where you can give via PayPal. If you would like to be a part of supporting these speakers as well, you can feel free to give um, on PayPal. Just make sure that you put the name of the speaker that you would like to support, okay? Please do that. Um, okay, what next? Uh, duh, duh, duh. And then so for the speakers that you're going to give to, all you're going to do is when we do the initial offering, when we do the offering and the plates go around, feel free to, you can put both. So you can put your offering and you can just put in a separate envelope uh, for whoever you want to give to. Just please make sure you write the name of the person somewhere on the envelope that you want it to go toward so we can keep track of that, okay? All right, awesome. Thanks so much. Um, we have our August fellowship is coming up. That's going to be next Saturday, um, sep- this upcoming Saturday, September 1st. Um, and that's going to be at the Lee family's house. Uh, it's going to be at 12 p.m. If you need the address or directions or anything like that, I will post on the WhatsApp. Um, but you can also come to me after church, and I will be happy to give you the address as well, Okay. All right, so if you can make it, please come out to that. Fellowship is really important. We saw that at summer camp, especially coming back. Um, that's, that's something that we really need, okay? Um, our memory verse, if you flip over to Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, we are going to finish out the chapter. So in Galatians chapter 5, where we've been memorizing a lot of the differences between Um, the spirit, works of the flesh, fruit of the spirit, stuff like that. We are going to finish out the chapter in verse 26. So Galatians chapter 5, verse 26, the Bible says, Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. So it's very interesting. In the same verse where it says we shouldn't be desirous of vain glory, it kind of even explains to you what that has to do with. It provokes one another, and it has to do with envying one another, okay? So stay away from the, that vain glory that you're seeking after, amen? I'm sure Brother Jack, would, he's not feeling vain glory that he was able to lead uh, Daniel to the Lord Jesus Christ today. That's, that's all the Lord, amen, brother? And so that's why we go out there. That's why uh, we try to keep track of, uh, you know, the amount of souls saved, Bibles given out, Stuff like that each month. We'll read it in the bulletin. Not because we're after vain glory, but we're trying to use it as a way to encourage the church to see, hey, wow, praise the Lord. By the grace of God, our church has actually been able to do something. And, um, and Lord knows that the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to hold the paper up to your face. He's going to show you how many hours you prayed for lost souls, how many hours you, know, you spent soul winning, how many hours you spent reading your Bible. So uh, numbers are not a bad thing, Amen. Amen? As long as your heart is in the right place with it. Amen? Because your works are going to be tried of what sort they are at the judgment seat of Christ. That's what it's all about is the heart. With that, uh, we have a special from Sister Joyce today. Accompanied by Brother Brent. Lift them up.
just be going to take up the Lord's offering. I would like to ask Brother Max and Brother Emilio to come forward and take up the Lord's offering for us. Brother Max and Brother Emilio to come forward and take up the Lord's offering for us. So at this offering plate, uh, this is for the church offering, and if you want to give something to the blowout speakers, uh, remember that you have an envelope there, and just mention that speaker's name in the envelope, and then you can give. For those who are new to our church and you have no idea what I just said or what our announcer just said, forget it, okay? The money is just going to go to the church, all right? Just think of it that way. If you don't have anything to give, don't worry about that. We just want your heart. That's it. All right, then. So, Brother Max, will you open up the offering with a word of prayer, please? That's right. That's good. That's good, Max. Yes. That's good, brother. Yes. Amen. All right, so Brother Brent uh, will be taking care of the children. So if you have any children to be taken care of, Brother Brent will take care of them. And then the Korean kids, they'll be taken care of by Sister Joyce. Okay, the rest of you, open up your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah chapter 13. We thank you so much for coming to San Jose Bible Baptist Church. We hope that the Lord will speak upon your hearts today and that you'll get a blessing out of the preaching. All right, we'll look at Nehemiah chapter 13, and then we'll look at verse 15. Nehemiah chapter 13, and then we'll look at verse 15. In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, and bringing in sheaves and lading asses, as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. They, there dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah, and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do, and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? 
Yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be open till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants said I at the gates that there should be no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and sellers of all kind of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. Then testify against them and said unto them, Why lodge ye about the wall? If ye do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. So you'll notice right here that there were people who were breaking the Sabbath day. In the Old Testament law, they were supposed to observe the Sabbath day and not do any work. However, there were merchants coming in and the Jews were doing business with them. So work was still ongoing. Business was ongoing at the Sabbath when there should be no work done on the Sabbath day. There should be no work. However, what happened is that Nehemiah intervened and he said, we're not going to allow these things to happen on the Sabbath day. Now, the Bible mentions that the merchants, they brought burdens with them. So, in other words, baggage, baggage with them. So they brought this baggage with them to make profit and to sell and do business. But Nehemiah said, get out of here. We don't want you in our city. Now, I believe that in our day and age, especially if you're living in an expensive area like this, there's a lot of baggage that goes on in our minds. How to pay the bills, how to pay the rent, how are we going to keep the church going, what are we going to do, uh, how am I going to feed the kids, how am I going to support the family. And then the liberalism is rising even higher and more, and there are things that where freedom of speech has gone out the window. And you got to be careful with how you talk to people, how you talk in the workplace, how you talk in school. And now they're going by a system where they want, where they're forbidding you to use certain pronouns and they give you certain pronouns that you're supposed to use. So we're living in a day and age where there's a lot of baggage in our life. But I want to tell you one thing, how you can get rid of the baggage. You just dump the baggage. You don't have to carry the baggage on you. You got to realize that a lot of times the baggage is done by yourself, done by sin, and it's also done by because you lack sufferance. So what I'm going to preach to you today will hopefully help you through your stressful situations that you're going through. I don't know what baggage you're carrying, but I hope this sermon will help you. The title of my message today is Dump the Baggage. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and wash away my sins with your blood. God, I'm unworthy to preach. I'm unworthy to speak. And you know, Lord God, there are many other people that you could use to preach your word. God, I'm just a broken vessel and I pray that you'll fill and mend and use me and that they will see the power of God manifested, but most importantly, that they will change their life Whatever baggage they're carrying, may it be laid down at the feet of Calvary. and May they walk off more scot-free in their mind and in their hearts so that they can live better lives for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. My first point, so here's the baggage that comes from, is my first point from self. From self. We got to realize that a lot of baggage we carry in our lives is from our own selves. Look at verses 15 through 16. In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, and look at this, and bringing in sheaves, and lading asses, as also wines, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem. Notice in verse 16, they also brought more baggage after that. So notice that the Jews were responsible themselves for bringing the baggage inside their city. And you got to realize that the baggage that you're carrying is done mostly from yourself. You'll be surprised. So you got to look at your heart and check your life and realize, what am I doing wrong, which is why I'm going through this amount of stress and pressure and hardship. 
You know, at John chapter 16, verse 24, you don't have to turn there. But Jesus said, Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name, so ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. Now, the first thing you should be doing, and my church should know this by now, because it's like you've heard this pastor saying this over and over again, but it's so surprising that human nature forgets this thing all the time. The first thing you need to do is call the pastor. No, do not call me, please, all right? I got enough phone calls and emails. Do not call me, okay? The first thing you need to do is you need to tell it to Jesus. You need to phone call the third heaven and tell God your problem. That's what you need to do. The problem with majority of people nowadays is that when they have a baggage they're carrying, they feel like they have to turn to the bottle. They have to turn to some kind of therapist. They have to turn to some kind of close friend that they can rely on. They feel like they have to take meds. They feel like that they have to perform sin or something. That way they can get rid of the baggage. But my friend, you got to realize that the first thing, the very first thing you got to do is not tolerate the pain, but to tell it to Jesus. You need to pray to the Lord. You'd be surprised on how many burdens would not even happen had you told it to God in prayer. God is right next door to you. And you got to realize that a lot of times uh, we deceive ourselves into thinking that, you know, I'm tough. I can handle this. I can, I'm tough and I can handle this. And then, you know, it's a noble thing to be strong in the Lord. But you got to realize that most of the time, if you're, if you're still feeling stressed out right now, then that better be a time you got to realize, you know what? I'm not as strong as I think I am. I better tell it to Jesus. I need to pray to God about my problem and ask him to help me, to release me from this pain. George Mueller, he prayed, I mean, millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. And he had to take care of an orphanage with scores of children. And you got to understand this too, is that he was during the time... Uh, before the 1900s where he and he got millions of dollars without begging for money without begging for money it was all done through the power of prayer as a matter of fact he kept a notes of every prayer request that he made that was answered as proof and evidence and then when they calculated it all together it estimated to millions of dollars Now, the amazing thing is that a man like this was able to get every single one of his needs provided, but not for us Christians. Are we doing something wrong here? Are you saying that God only does it for certain people like George Mueller, but not for us? You know what the problem is? We're not praying enough. We're not relying on God enough. We're not claiming his promise enough. It's not that, oh, God elects a certain individual and say, I love you, George Mueller, but I hate Gene Kim, so I'm not going to, I'm going to ignore 90% of his prayers. That's not how it works. You got to realize that what George Mueller had was something you didn't have. That's what it, that's what's going on. Why your prayers aren't getting answered. It's because you're not doing it right. You're not praying enough. You're not trusting in God. And you got to realize Mueller had to take care of scores of children. So he had quite a plateful in his schedule, I'm sure, more than you. He had to keep track of everything with the kids, worry about this kid and that kid. You think that it's tough already with 10 kids in your home to take care of? Imagine George Mueller with scores and scores of children. So there's no excuse. You got to realize that it's something that I'm doing wrong. I'm not praying. I'm not relying on God. You're too busy doing this. Rather than falling on your knees and praying to the Lord. Let me also say this. Thank God that you watched us online. And praise the Lord. The Lord used our videos to reach out to you and help you in some way. But I want to tell you something. If you watch something, and that includes our ministry, you spend more time on YouTube rather than falling on your knees to the Lord and reading his word, there's something wrong. Because you got to realize this, uh, that you can't make this person your final authority of your life. You got to make the king of kings the final authority of your life. 
If there's any, if there's any accomplishment the Lord used us mightily online, you got to realize this. All I can do is give it back to the King of Kings. That's the only, and I really believe it with all my heart, that's the only reason why the Lord was able to bless me this much. So that's one thing you're going to learn when you come to this church. One thing you're going to learn in this church when you come over here, I mean, they'll respect, they'll honor, they'll be grateful to the pastor, but I'll tell you one thing, they're going to look at him. They're going to look at God Almighty. That's who they're going to be looking at. That's going to be our focus in this church. Many times the burden baggage you go through is sometimes some fantasy you created, which is why the baggage that you're carrying is actually your own delusion. Didn't you realize that? A lot of times that's the case. But let me give you uh, an example right here. Now, this is a crazy example, but this is going to speak a lot to paranoid people. If you ever got to know a paranoid person who gets fearful of riding an airplane, one of the things that they'll do is this. What they're going to do is that they're going to reach out for every straw, possible straw, of an explanation why, that they, can, why they can't ride an airplane and why they're going to crash. Now, is it going to crash? No, I, I, I rode airplane lots of times, and it's not like I, that it fell down because it's too heavy. But inside the mind of some paranoid people, they're going to be thinking, it weighs tons. I mean, it weighs so heavy. How can that just fly easily up in the air? It, they are reaching out for a, every straw of an explanation to why it can't happen. And the worst part is this. What legitimizes their fear is that it's possible possible that's what legitimizes their fear we don't think it's probable and it's not like it's going to happen we'll be fine we're going to fly i'll bet you five thousand dollars that plane's going to take off not just crash down like that but is it possible it can fall and crash yeah yet there are thousands to millions of people who ride airplanes every day yet why is it that why is it that we can do it without fear when there's a possibility that a plane could crash that you're riding on. The thing is this, is that that's the same thing with our fears. What makes us consistently in fearful mode is that we keep looking at possibilities around us. But you got to realize that nothing is impossible with God. God, when you're on God's side, everything works out. But see, the fear, you legitimize it. You validate it. It's so heavy, like an airplane. I mean, you don't think it's possible that it can fall? It's possible. And then you start to fantasize. You start to think of, this bad thing could happen in my household. This bad thing could happen in my finances. Uh, you know, something's going to come in my mailbox that I'm going to fear what it's going to tell me concerning about my financial situation right here. My children, they're not going to listen to me. My husband's not listening to me. My wife is not listening to me. There's problems going on in this church. I got enemies in my workplace. I got enemies in the church. I got enemies around the world. And then because of that, what you do is that you create a monster and you created a bag that Jesus did not even intend for you to carry. The baggage you're carrying, you'd be surprised, was created by yourself, not by the devil, not by the world, not by problems around you, not by God testing you. It's you. You're the one who created the baggage of a problem. You created, you know what you just created? You created a monster. That's going to give you sleepless nights and worry and fear throughout your daily activities that you can't even focus what you're doing. That's what you've created. You created a monster, a scary monster. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. Notice what keeps you safe is that if you have discretion, and wisdom. Sometimes you got to realize that a lot of baggage in your life, listen up now, is again from your own careless actions. That's why, you know, there's a thing where you got to think ahead in the future. You got a plan. I mean, look, if you're going to get married and have kids, you got a plan. You can't just go for it because the person is good looking 
and that because you want kids. So then when you have health insurance problems, family problems, relationship problems, house rent problems, etc., you got no one to blame but yourself. You got to realize that a lot of times uh, we want things now. That's our problem. And we don't want to put extra work and effort. And we don't want to plan things ahead. So because of that, that's why we live every day in the moment. And then if you're living like that and then you're going through some kind of pain right now, listen up now. If there's some pain or baggage that you're going through right now, perhaps it's because you did not think ahead. Look back in your years. Maybe you could have done, well, I should have done this. I should have done that. I should have planned this ahead, prepared for this outcome. But because of my careless mistake, that's why these bad things have happened. So here are three things that you should ask yourself before you do anything or make a decision. Before you do something, do you always pray for wisdom and direction so you don't do anything foolish and dumb? You know what I do before I come to church on Sunday? I always pray to God for wisdom and discretion. You might say, why? Because I'm going to say something careless. Should you be afraid of that? Yeah, I got uh, thousands of video online. <laughs> so yeah, I should pray. Lord, give me wisdom. Lord, give me wisdom. So that you don't do anything foolish and dumb. Do you always pray before you do something? Or you just do it because you're used to it? That's good. Here's a second question you should ask yourself. Before you do something, do you think about the consequences? Do you think about, you know, when this bad outcome happens, this time I'm going to be ready? Do you have to think like that, Pastor? Yeah. I can't think like, okay, every one year I'll at least have three more people at church, you know, at the very least, at the very least. No, what happened was, you know, when I was hitting 30 and above and I'm like, okay, we can move out and then drop to three people. And I was like, what am I doing wrong, God? And it's actually not that I'm doing what's wrong. It's just that that's how people are. So then what happened? I prepared myself ahead of time, realizing that if I only have one person here, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to close the door until God says you're done. So if there's any fruit that happened from this ministry of souls getting saved and hearing Bible believing truth, it's because of that tenacity at the beginning. But the people who were with me at the very beginning knew what, how our church condition was like. They knew how bad it was and how we had to hang in there literally. So you have to prepare ahead of time. Because I had that preparation, I didn't quit. But perhaps many pastors and missionaries have closed their church doors because they did not think that far ahead. They got discouraged thinking, what am I doing wrong? I'm not capable. I'm not talented to pastor a church. It's because something I said wrong. I may have offended a person. I should have followed up on the person better. No, it's because you got to realize sometimes people are just flesh. And so the pastors, they should have said, I should have hung in there. If they prepared themselves about family problems, of their own problems and church problems, they wouldn't get so much discouraged before. That's the thing. Third question you should ask yourself before you do something, is that the smartest and the safest thing to do? Ask yourself that question. Let's say that you're in a situation where any decision you make is bad. Well, at least you're going to be at the safest point, right, when you make the decision. That's what you got to do. Even if it's a dumb decision, at least pick the best one. So before you do something, ask yourself this. Is this the smartest and safest thing to do? Maybe that's why we're still online. Maybe that's why we're not in prison yet. Maybe that's why we're still able to street preach because we had to make decisions on what's the safest and the smartest thing to do. See, you got to realize that you're living in the devil's world. This is not God's kingdom. This is the devil's world. You're in his playground, his territory. And when you're doing that, you got to realize it's not like knowing every single conspiracy out there and save your guns and your gold and let's just speak out and rebel against the government. If you do that, trust me, don't, uh, don't blame God. Don't blame others. You got nothing, no one to blame but yourself if, you're, if they take away your free speech and imprison you and you can't speak out the truth. You know what you got to do? You can't just go like that. 
You got to be smart. Jesus said, I send you as sheep in the midst of wolves. That's why Jesus said, therefore, be wise as serpents, harmless as a dove. Think about this. If some of you who research stuff online, if you're upset about all the elites and rulers of this world, you got to think about this. How did they take control over the world? Did they go like, I worship Satan, ah, in, in, C, in front of CNN? No, they were like a serpent sneaking in. And that's what you need to do. That's why Jesus would be wise as serpents. Sneak it in. Harmless as a dove. We're not dangerous people when we pass out a track and smile at you and say, Good morning, sir and ma'am. Do you know Jesus Christ for your salvation? Harmless. That's why we can, we can praise the Lord about all the souls that we led to salvation in street preaching. Street preaching of all things. Street preaching, you got to realize. And on YouTube and on the news media, they look down on street preachers. And we get so many no's just on our corner. No, no, no. But yet we still survive. We one time had the cops on us, but they were so, they were so nice people. I thought that we were in trouble, and then they were talking to one of my members, and one of my members didn't all go, no, I have the right to free speech, blah, blah, blah. No, what? he used wisdom. He used wisdom. And trust me, this brother right here, I'm talking about Brother Sean, he watched a lot of things online, you'd be surprised. But you know, he used wisdom because he knew the right focus on what to do. And that's why we can still survive as a church. We can still function and we can still have the freedom to preach the gospel. So think about that. My second point is from sin. From sin. We won't read those verses for time's sake, but if you look at verses 17 through 18, notice Nehemiah preached against the Jews here saying that because of these sins that your fathers did, you're doing the same thing. That's why we're getting these burdens. So the baggage you're carrying in your life is very simple. Sometimes it's because of a sin that you're messing around with. You know what's so amazing about human nature? I'll never understand this. We cannot let go of sin no matter how bad the baggage is. We know we got to come to church. We, get, we know we got to do so winning. We know that we got to stay away from what we're hearing and what we're seeing and the people that we're hanging around with and etc. But we just won't let go of our sin. You know, it, it reminds me of a story John G. Wendell had a sister who died in 1931 with $100 million. Wow, that's a lot of money. But you know, she only had one dress all her life. <laughs> no telephone, no electricity, no automobile. You know why? Because she pitifully and miserably hoarded and kept every dollar that much. And she died $100 million without spending it. You know why? Because she's thinking in her mind, this is $100 million, $100 million, $100 million. It's so precious. I cannot let it go. Well, that's why she lived a miserable life. She did not live like a millionaire after that. You can have $100 million, but what good is it if you don't even use it? But that's the same thing with sin. We can't let it go. It's, we're thinking $100 million. I need this sin. It's $100 million to me. $100 million. Yeah, wait till you die. It won't feel like $100 million. You can't take it to the grave with you. What does sin do? I'll tell you what sin does. You can watch our video online, Penalty of Sin. and It, it will give you terror of the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to reap what you sow. You're going to face chastisement from the Lord. You're going to face destruction in your own life. You're going to go through health problems health problems and even death and you're going to be restless in your conscience you're going to have the holy spirit bothering you convicting you about it and shall i go on and on and on sin is that much worth it isn't it galatians chapter 6 verse 7 through 8 as well as hosea chapter 8 verse 7 it reads be not deceived god is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption the Bible says over here, for they have sown the wind and they have reaped the whirlwind. It hath no stalk. The bud shall yield no meal. 
If so be it yield, the stranger shall swallow it up. You got to realize this. The burden baggage that you're carrying right now, sometimes you got to think about this. You may be living clean now. You may have repented and started living for God right now. But you're still going through baggages in your life. And it feels like that you followed everything right. But why is it you're still going through baggage? You got to think about this. Sin has a way, its penalty and consequence has a way of reaching out even years later. That's why some people, they'll still keep drinking, fornicating, and smoking because they're not feeling the price and penalty of sin yet. And then when they start to come to church and serve God and quit smoking, quit drinking, quit fornicating, and still and live for Jesus Christ, all of a sudden these bad things start happening. And then we whine and cry, oh, I'm just being uh, persecuted by the devil. No, it's because sin finally caught up to you. It's penalty. You're having problems with relationships later on. You're having problems with your health later on. You got to look back in your years and think about what stupid mistakes that you made. That's one thing I learned. We human beings don't think about our, the consequences of our action. You got to realize sin, that's what it does. It has a way of reaching out later on. Didn't you know that sometimes you might think that the consequence is just too great. It's too heavy. Lord, just because of this harmless thing, I mean, I know it's a sin, but it's not that bad. It's not like I killed anybody. It's not like I actually hurt the pastor or people in the church. But really, God, I have to go through this kind of hardship in my life. This is the penalty for sin. That's so unfair. God already told you that sin is unfair. Whoever told you that sin is fair, then you're not thinking straight. Really eating a fruit off the tree, then you get disease, corruption, famine, and hardship just because Adam and Eve disobeyed God? Yeah, who told you sin played fair with you? You know what we think? We think that, oh, if I do this thing, then I should get a fair amount at the end. You got to realize that sin don't play fair with you. Sin is wicked, evil, detrimental. It's so hurtful that you don't think how bad it is. You think that you can do this sin because, oh, I'll just get judged like this at the judgment seat or in my life. No! Sin is ugly. Sin is dreadful. It's like drinking 99% water, but 1% of arsenic acid, poisonous acid in there. That's enough to drop you dead. Doesn't matter 88%, 1%, or something like that. You got to realize sometimes sin has much more of a heavy price than you think. The Bible says you've uh, sown the wind, you're going to reap the what? Whirlwind. See, just because you sow the wind, you're not going to get the wind back. You're going to get a whirlwind back at you. Because once Satan sees a crack, he's going to tear it into a big hole. You think Satan's going to be fair with you? Oh, yeah, I know that you just did that little amount of sin. So, you know what? I'll just give you a little amount of pain right here. No, Satan wants to kill you if he had his way. He wanted you to burn in hell forever with him if he had his way. Don't give sin an inch. It'll carry a mile. We delude ourselves with how hard it is, how hard the baggage is, because there are two particular sins that I notice, and that is discontentment and weakness. Discontentment and weakness is another contributing factor. These are sins that give us baggage. Look, I understand that the trial and the suffering that you're going through, it may be hard and stuff like that, but you got to understand this. You ready for this? It is still a sin when you're not content. It is still a sin when you're not strong in the Lord. Sometimes we don't understand that. Sometimes we want somebody to cry with us and comfort us. And don't get us wrong, we're not a hard church. The Bible actually says we're supposed to comfort the feeble-minded. Not to beat them over the head. But because this becomes now a dangerous trend, though. Because we're so used to experience the love of the brethren and helping each other, praying for each other, and crying each other's shoulders, that we don't stop to think that, do I have the sin of discontentment and the sin of weakness in my heart? We don't stop to think, am I sinning? That will solve the baggage, is that if you realize I'm sinning here. 
Now, there's a person named McCoy who was president of an organization you would not believe. It's called Uglies Unlimited. Why? They were protesting against companies who were hiring good-looking people for their advertisements. According to this person, he claimed that 10% of Americans were ugly and they were suffering discrimination. But surprisingly, if you look through their list of people who cried out discrimination for their ugliness, you'd be surprised some of them aren't really that ugly. Some of them think they thought that they were ugly. They were suffering the burden of ugliness because they gained a little weight or they have some baldness. They have a little slightly larger nose or a little discoloring of the skin, etc. But the complaint went on and on and on on why they believed they looked ugly. And see, you know what that is? That, if you think that is so silly, you know how that contributed, that silliness? Th these people don't realize what they did was wrong. What they did was sin. Oh, poor you, poor you, you know, no, 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 no. I mean, ugly, I'm so sorry, poor you, poor you. No, they were in the wrong here. They're sitting here. One thing I learned about this community, now don't get me wrong, I believe in helping out people. I'm very glad about, uh, despite of the liberalism rising, they do have a heart for people, trying to help people out. But you got to realize this, by doing that, it gives advantage to people to take opportunity and to spoil themselves and sin against God, thinking that they have a legitimate problem when they don't have a problem. You know what the problem with people today is? Discontentment and weakness, just like these people in this organization. Yeah, they were discontent with how they looked. And about a slightly issue with, their, with their, how they looked, they made a big deal out of it. How can you be so weak-minded yeah, about good. that? Yeah. What are you? Look, if you, look, if you think that we're, so, oh man, we're suffering discrimination. Oh, poor us, poor us. Donald Trump, what a dictator. We're, we're at the end of the world. Look back at 1500s where Bible-believing Christians were burning at the stakes. Who are you looking at, man? You know what? We live in a, we gotten weaker. We gotten so weak that we're crying about the smallest thing. I mean, we wouldn't even come to church if the air condition just busted. And you got to realize there are Christians right now in Mexico who I know, missionaries who are doing outdoor services in the heat. And they sing better and they praise God better and they have a heart for Jesus better than us. This, this Silicon Valley, this liberal area is making us all soft, you know, crying about the smallest thing. We cry and whine about anything, you know. A blade of grass just died and we think it's the end of the world, you know. And we cry, ah! What in the world? We live, we, we live in a, uh, if you look back, just look back at history of the early Christians. You notice how much we gotten more sensitive and sensitive and sensitive and sensitive now. And there are certain words you can't use anymore that's ridiculous. My last point is from sufferance, from sufferance. Look at verses 19 through 21. I won't read it for time's sake, but in 19 through 21, notice that these people allowed the merchants to come in with their burdens from sufferance. And that's the thing is that I think that's the greatest, one of the greatest things why we feel like we have so much baggage is because we suffer it. We tolerate it. We allow it inside in our lives. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, it says what? To look at who? The living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. One thing I learned about myself is, you know, it is so easy for me to legitimize my problems as a Bible-believing pastor, crying about, you know, oh, all these people are attacking me, and then in Silicon Valley, it's so hard to start a church, and then blah, 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 and I'm all, all alone, and it's so easy to do that, but when I do that, I overlook so many things that God has given me to enjoy in my life. And see, you got to realize this, look. Your burden, I can feel you that it's hard and that you want to cry about it, but do you, are you allowing it to take control of your life so you can stay depressed and miserable? Or are you going to kick it out and start looking the blessings around you and say, 
thank you, Lord, for a wonderful husband, a wonderful wife, wonderful children. Thank you so much for our pastor, brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for a roof over my head, Lord Jesus Christ, when so many people are struggling to find a place by themselves in this area. And people, they don't count their blessings. We don't dump the baggage. Instead, we allow the burden baggage into our lives. When you cry about the baggage you're going through, my question to you is this. Do you take advantage of the blessing, not a burden, the blessing of reading his Bible and praying to him? You want to cry? You want to complain? It's Jesus Christ. And then you just read his word and you pray to him. Do you take advantage of a church? So many people don't take advantage of a Bible-believing church. They cry about the smallest problem in church, and that's their reason why they don't come back anymore. Well, let me tell you something. No church is perfect, not even ours. One day, you're going to come across something you're not going to like me do, and trust me, I'm going to see something in your life that I don't like either. Wow, big news, right? But you got to realize this, that's what life is, and you're going to lose the blessing of enjoying fellowship with the brethren, right. singing hymns together, and hearing the word of God preach, having that personal contact with people, yeah. rather than being alone by yourself. You know, one thing I notice is that the more you're online by yourself, it can be very depressing and miserable. What's interesting to me, when I, talk, when I post videos about depression, loneliness, and misery, I get a lot of views and a lot of comments on that. And sometimes, now, I'm not trying to chew out onliners, but I want them to look at their hearts. Is it because you're all alone by yourself, not attending a Bible-believing church? See, that's the thing. For some of you who don't know where to find a Bible-believing church, our resources link is always mentioned at the end of the video. Click on the link underneath all of our videos and then... Just follow the directions. It'll show you how to find a Bible-believing church. If you're still having trouble, email us. Comments, I don't keep track because there's so many, but if you email us, then our workers are going to get back to you and help you. We're here for that. Because we understand the importance of church. Church is not a drag. It's supposed to help you with the baggage you're going through. And how many of you felt that way? Like you're going to Monday, Tuesday, and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday. There's so much baggage, but then when you come to church, it's like you're venting out some things, right? It's like that relief. Take advantage of the Christian friends the Lord has given to you. Well, they're a different culture from me. They're a different age from me. They're, my friend, you're missing out a blessing. Can't you think of the good things that they do for you? Can't you think of a blessing they can be to you that they can pray for you? Soul winning. You don't take advantage of witnessing, going out and witnessing to souls. Do you know how much thrill, uh, thrill and excitement that gives in your life to actually witness to a soul and seeing them bow their head and receive Jesus Christ run in front of your face? There are so many things in this world that you can enjoy too. Look, there's always a fast food joint or a grocery store or some kind of toy store or 7-Eleven that's like right around the corner. And you've got the sky to look up at God's creation. And you've got places around you. You've got a car. I mean, you've got, th you got things in your house to enjoy. Otherwise, you wouldn't even buy them. You bought them so that you can enjoy them. But you know what you've done? You bought them, you kept them, and you let it sit. See, the thing is, is that God has given to us richly all things to enjoy. Why don't you take advantage of that? Well, boo, my life is so boring. There's nothing to do for God. I mean, there's nothing to do for fun, says a young person. Oh, you know, being a teenager for the Lord is hard because I'm isolated from my friends and they think I'm a weirdo. I can't do anything. Hey, man, do you got things in your bedroom? Do you got things in your family that you can enjoy with? There's a theme park. There's golf. Do something, man. Do you have a ball? Play ball. Do something. Have fun. And don't whine and cry. Do you claim and enjoy his promises? And that would release a lot of stress from your life is that if you kept a list of all of his promises in his words, he will provide all your needs. He will answer your requests. He promised that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. 
He promised he'll give you his peace. He promised that every suffering you go through, he'll give more reward up in heaven. You don't claim his promises. That's right. And that's what I had to do. I had to blind myself from the things that I'm looking in this earth and to open my eyes on the things of the invisible things in heaven. And that's what kept me going as a pastor many times is God, even though my flesh is feeling miserable, what a blessing you've given to me in my life because I see this promise and that promise you've given to me. Ultimately, we don't claim the promise of Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Anything we're going through in our life, we're scared. We're fearful. We've made mistakes. And because of our mistakes, we're afraid of doing some things because we don't want to make more mistakes. But one thing I've learned as a pastor that I could not fear about the mistakes that I make while I'm preaching and teaching. I had to learn to just go just trust God. I prepared. I've done my part. Now just trust God. And whatever happens to people in the church or online, let it have thine own way, Lord. And that's the best stress relief medicine you'll ever have is just literally dumping the baggage at the feet of Jesus and saying, whatever happens, God, you do whatever you want. But see, you don't trust him with that. That's your problem. You don't trust him with whatever happens do whatever you want, Lord. You don't trust him with that. Colossians chapter 1, verse 11 says, Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. The verse says this. Yeah, you know, there's suffering and there's patience, but it's done with joyful, joyfulness. There's something you got to look at yourself in your life. The baggage you're carrying, let's look at it. If we can truly say to ourselves, it's not from me, and it's not from my sin, it's not other things that I've allowed inside, it's genuinely from God, which is true. God will test his children. Sometimes it comes from nowhere else but just from God, just to test your faith. I'm going to say something that you need to keep in mind. God never intended to give you a burden where you lose your joy. May I repeat that again? God never intended to give you a burden where you lose your joy. He always intended to give you peace and joy while you're going through the burdens of this life. He promised joy unspeakable and full of glory, and he's not a liar. So you know what you need to do when that burden baggage comes near your gate, like Nehemiah? Nehemiah said to the merchants, if you come near here, I'm going to lay my hands on you. And when worry, fear, financial problems, family problems, church problems, or whatever that baggage is that you're carrying, your sinful addictions that's causing more baggage. When it's arriving at your gate, you need to say, get out of here and release and dump the baggage. Get out of here. I'm, if you come near me, I'm going to dump you. And I would encourage you today to challenge your flesh. Look at your baggage and say, get out of here. I dump it right here on the altar and come to this altar and dump the baggage at the feet of Jesus. And once you go back to your seat, leave the baggage here and don't carry it back with you. Amen. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. The Lord, if the Lord led it upon your heart, please feel free to come forward here on the altar's floor where you can pray. You can pray in your seats or you can come forward like the rest of these people and dump the baggage. Dump the baggage. At this time, what we give to you with every head bow and every eye shut is that you can pray to the Lord about your baggage, about your problem that you're going through, and let him carry it for you. If there's a burden and a baggage that you're carrying in your life, why not pray about it to the Lord and let him release you from your problem, from your fear? 
what we always do as a church, especially for people who are new in our church, is that we want to make sure that you are saved and going to heaven after you die. Seriously ask yourself this question. If you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you can go to heaven after you die? You might say, Pastor, I'm not 100% sure I can go to heaven. Well, you can know right now. Why not know right now? There are three easy steps to get saved. That's it. That's all you need to do. First step is to realize that you've sinned. So sin is a crime to God, and he punishes sin with hellfire. Well, let's be honest. We've all sinned. So because we've sinned, the penalty is burning in hell forever. You've got to first understand that. Well, we're at number two now. Number two, Jesus is God, and he doesn't want you to burn in hell forever. So he died, buried, and resurrected. Okay, why, do we, why did he do that? We know that story so many times. Jesus died, buried, and resurrected. But do you understand why that story is so important? I'll tell you why. Remember, sin is the problem why you go to hell, right? Yeah. Only his blood can wash away your sin. That's why Jesus died. So his blood can get rid of your sin because remember, you're stuck in sin, and sin will send you to hell. So you need something to wash away that sin, give you a clean slate. Only his blood, only what he did on the cross gave you that clean slate. Okay, so I need that, Pastor. I need that blood to give me that clean slate. So we're at number three. Number three, let's review, sin is the problem. So you need to be convicted over your sin. You need to repent. When you repent... All you can do is just believe in that blood he shed on the cross to save you. You might say, don't I have to go to church? Don't I have to get baptized? Don't I have to clean up my sin problems and start being a good Christian, a follower of Jesus? No, nothing you work or do can ever save you. Only what he did on the cross saves you. But you can only believe and trust in him if you would... Just repent as a sinner and rely and trust what he did on the cross. You might say, well, I can do that, Pastor. Great, then all you have to do is just say that to God. If you would say it to God, God, I repent as a sinner and I only believe that blood to give me the clean slate, you're done. It's that simple. You're saved. It's that simple. All you have to do is say it to God. You might say, well, pastor, I don't know how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, I can help you out. I'll give you the words on how to say it, and you can simply repeat after me. But remember this, repeating words, repeating words in a prayer will never save you. It's only by believing what he did on the cross. I'm just helping you say, saying it to God. That's all, all right? You don't have to say it out loud either, okay? This is totally private. No one knows who you are with every head bow and eyes shut. And I'm not going to point out who you are. You can just say it privately to yourself. You don't even have to say it out loud. You can just say it privately to yourself too. So you can say it this way. You can repeat after me. Dear God, I repent as a sinner. I believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so his blood can wash away my sin. I'm only trusting what you did on the cross to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. If you can just bow your head and close your eyes one last time, please, 60 seconds, and then we're done. Thank you so much for your patience. If you can just bow your head, close your eyes just one last time. Now, no one knows who you are, and I'm not going to point out who you are. If you just got saved just now, if you say, preacher, I just repeated those words after you, could you just slip up your hand real briefly, real quick? I'm not going to point out who you are. Every head is bowed and every eye shut. Could you just slip up your hand right now so that I can do a special prayer for you? Can you slip up your hand right now if you repeated those words after me? Okay. 
All right, I appreciate your honesty. Thank you. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I trust that everybody here has trusted in the blood of Christ for their salvation. And for those who are carrying baggage in their lives, I pray that has been laid down at the feet of the cross. Lord God, you never intended us to carry the burdens. You said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are in heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Bless the lunch and the fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church, as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the 